Chapter Sixteen of the Hoosier Schoolmaster by Edward Eggleston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Bridget Gage. Chapter Sixteen: The Church Militant. Bud was doubly enlisted on the side of John Pearson, the basket maker. In the first place, he knew that this persecution of the unpopular old man was only a blind to save somebody else; that they were thieves who cried, "Stop, thief!" and he felt consequently that this was a chance to put his newly formed resolutions into practice. The Old Testament religious life, which consists in fighting the Lord's enemies, suited Bud's temper and education. It might lead to something better. It was the best possible to him now. But I am afraid I shall have to acknowledge that there was a second motive that moved Bud to this championship. The good heart of Martha Hawkins, having espoused the cause of the basket-maker, the heart of Bud Means could not help feeling warmly on the same side. Blessed is that man in whose life the driving of duty and the drawing of love impel the same way. But why speak of the driving of duty? For already Bud was learning the better lesson of serving God for the love of God. The old basket-maker was the most unpopular man in Flat Creek District. He had two great vices— he would go to Clifty and have a spree once in three months, and he would tell the truth in a most unscrupulous manner. A man given to plain speaking was quite as objectionable in Flat Creek as he would have been in France under the Empire, the Commune, or the Republic, and almost as objectionable as he would be in any refined community in America. People who live in glass houses have a horror of people who throw stones, and the old basket-maker, having no friends, was a good scapegoat. In driving him off, Pete Jones would get rid of a dangerous neighbor, and divert attention from himself. The immediate crime of the basket-maker was that he had happened to see too much. "'Mr. Hartsook,' said Bud, when they got out into the road, "'you'd better go straight home to the squires, because if this lightning strikes a second time, it'll strike awful close to you. You hadn't better be seen with us. Which way did you come, Shocky?' "'Why, I tried to come down the holler, but I met Jones right by the big road, "'and he sweared at me, and said he'd kill me if I didn't go back and stay. "'And so I went back to the house, and then slipped out through the graveyard. "'You see, I was bound to come if I got skinned. "'For Mrs. Pearson's stuck to me, and I mean to stick to him, you see.' "'Bud led Shocky through the graveyard, "'but when they reached the forest path from the graveyard, "'he thought that perhaps it was not best to show his hand, "'as he expressed it too soon.' "'Now, Shocky,' he said, "'do you run ahead and tell the old man "'that I want to see him right off down by the spring in rock. "'I'll keep close behind you, "'and if anybody offers to trouble you, "'do you let off a yell, and I'll be thar in no time.' "'When Ralph left the schoolhouse, he felt mean. "'There were Bud and Shocky gone on an errand of mercy, "'and he, the truant member of the Church of the Best Licks, "'was not with them.' The more he thought of it, the more he seemed to be a coward, and the more he despised himself. So, yielding as usual to the first brave impulse, he leaped nimbly over the fence, and started briskly through the forest in a direction intersecting the path on which were Bud and Shocky. He came in sight just in time to see the first conflict of the church in the wilderness with her foes. For Shocky's little feet went more swiftly on their eager errand than Bud had anticipated. He got farther out of Bud's reach than the latter intended he should, and he did not discover Pete Jones, until Pete, with his hog-drover's whip, was right upon him. Shocky tried to halloo for Bud, but he was like one in a nightmare. The yell died into a whisper which could not have been heard ten feet. I shall not repeat Mr. Jones' words. They were frightfully profane. But he did not stop at words. He swept his whip round and gave little Shocky one terrible cut. Then the voice was released, and the piercing cry of pain brought Bud down the path flying. "'You good-for-nothing scoundrel,' growled Bud. "'You're a coward and a thief to be a beaten a little creeter like him.' And with that Bud walked up on Jones, who prudently changed his position in such a way as to get the upper side of the hill. "'Well, I gin you the upper side, but come on,' cried Bud. "'If you ain't feared to fight somebody besides a poor little sickly baby or a crippled soldier,' "'Come on!' Pete was no insignificant antagonist. He had been a great fighter, and his well-seasoned arms were like iron. He had not the splendid set of Bud, 
but he had more skill and experience in the rude tournament of fists to which the backwoods is so much given now being out of sight of witnesses and sure that he could lie about the fight afterward he did not scruple to take advantages which would have disgraced him forever if he had taken them in a public fight on election day or at a muster he took the uphill side and he clubbed his whipstock striking bud with all his force with the heavy end which coward-like he had loaded with lead bud threw up his strong left arm and parried the blow which however was so fierce that it fractured one of the bones of the arm throwing away his whip pete rushed upon bud furiously intending to overpower him but bud slipped quickly to one side and let jones pass down the hill and as jones came up again means dealt him one crushing blow that sent him full length upon the ground nothing but the leaves saved him from a most terrible fall jones sprang to his feet more angry than ever at being whipped by one whom he regarded as a boy and drew a long dirk knife but he was blind with rage and bud dodged the knife and this time gave pete a blow on the nose which marred the homeliness of that feature and doubled the fellow up against a tree ten feet away ralph came in sight in time to see the beginning of the fight and he arrived on the ground just as pete jones went down under the well-dealt blow from the only remaining fist of bud means while ralph examined bud's disabled left arm pete picked himself up slowly and muttering what he felt considerable shuck up like crawled away like a whipped puppy to every one whom he met pete whose intellect seemed to have weakened in sympathy with his frame remarked feebly that he was considerable shuck up like and vouchsafed no other explanation even to his wife he only said that he felt purty considerable shuck up like and that the boys would have to get on to-night without him there are some scoundrels whose very malignity is shaken out of them for the time being by a thorough drubbing i'm afraid you're going to have trouble with your arm bud said ralph tenderly never mind i put in my best licks for him that air time mr hartsook ralph shivered a little at the thought of this but if it was right to knock jones down at all why might not bud do it heartily as unto the lord gideon did not feel any more honest pleasure in chastising the midianites than did bud in sending pete jones away purty considerable shuck up like End of chapter 16